Hey, Aaron Rabinowitz here for Red Giant TV. In this nostalgic episode of Red Giant TV, Harry Frank will bring us back to the days of yesteryear. The days before TiVo and on-demand video, back in the late 70s and early 80s, where CBS would throw this logo up on our 4x3 aspect ratio cathode ray tube TV screens and preempt our regularly scheduled primetime programs with something new and exciting and crammed full of famous people like Telly Savalas, Carol Channing, and Sammy Davis Jr. And in this episode of Red Giant TV, Harry Frank will walk us through recreating that logo's look and feel. Take it away, Harry. Hi, folks. Harry Frank from Red Giant here. If you're about 30 years old or older, chances are this logo animation holds a special place in your heart. Because when you saw this, this meant that instead of watching something boring on TV like Quincy or the Waltons, that something cool is coming like Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. So I decided to deconstruct this and put it back together in After Effects. Now to do this I used Trapcode Echo Space. And as I went along and put this together I realized I needed to come up with a new way of mapping colors to Trapcode Echo Space layers. And this is mainly what I'll be showing you today. So we'll go through Trapcode Echo Space and then we'll go through some new concepts on using expressions to sample a gradient and apply that to all of your echo space layers. It's not really that complicated and I'll post the project for you to download. So let's get started. Now the first thing to understand about echo space is that it doesn't really render any pixels on its own. It creates and controls other After Effects layers. So I'm going to drop a type layer into my composition here. This is simply type with uh, avant-garde to get that perfectly round C in the center. I'll, I'll make this 3D and uh, we'll do the basic animation with this. So I'll set a keyframe for position. Actually, let's move it back just a little bit. And then over about a second and a half, we'll have it move towards the camera. And I should also collapse the transformations on this so that the text doesn't get fuzzy. Uh, and let's also do the 180 degree turn. So it's just going to do that. Okay, so let's apply echo space. So I'll go to effect trap code echo space. The first section here is the setup. We tell echo space how many layers are going to be created in addition to the first layer. The first layer is sort of like the parent layer. It's the primary layer that everything else follows. So if I set this number of instances to 15, we will have 16 layers that are duplicates of this. So I'll hit repeat. And as it moves toward the camera, they are all moving at the same time. Not very interesting. Although what you can see is it's got a little bit of a 3D effect because by default, the repeater, which controls how one layer uh, transforms in relation to the layer behind it, is set to 10. So each of these is offset in 10 pixels from each other, creating sort of that 3D effect. If I zero that out, they'll all be in the same space. But what I'm gonna do is go down to the delay section and take a look at these two different delay settings. We've got a transform delay and a repeater delay. Transform delay affects transformations inherited from the primary layer, the parent layer. So if I set this to 0.1, this will delay the transformations as they are inherited by all these layers down here. Essentially, this creates a sort of echoing effect. So this layer will be delayed 0.1 seconds from the first layer. The third layer will be delayed 0.1 seconds from the second layer. Fourth layer delayed 0.1 seconds from the third layer, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how we get the sort of echoing kind of effect. Now as these start to fill up the screen and it starts to get a little cluttered, I can go into the repeater section here and set this opacity to a negative value so that we uh, start to thin these out just a little bit. I'll just leave it at negative 10. So the repeater controls how each copy repeats in relation to the copy behind it. So if I Go back to my the first frame here, get rid of my keyframes, and I set the repeater to 
offset and a negative value, this will take it towards the screen, towards where my camera view is, although I don't really have a camera. I guess I'll create a camera now. So these copies are all moving towards the screen. Now if I animate this, so let's start this at zero and have these animate to negative, um, yeah, negative 150. At this point in time where my uh, playback head is, each layer is 150 pixels apart. And at this point, they are zero pixels apart. So it animates from one to the other. But there is no delay going on here. So the repeater delay delays the actions of the repeater. The transform delay delays the actions inherited from the transforms. So if I do a little playback here, we'll see that these spread out, but there's sort of cascading or echoing. Pretty cool. So let's zero this all out. Let's hit reset on echo space and hit clean. Now there are three types of delay in echo space. I showed you two of them. The last one is simply called layer delay. And this is in the creation process. So if I hit repeat, we'll get 10 layers and they will all be physically spaced out in the timeline by 0.1 seconds. This is useful if you've got stuff going on inside a pre-comp. Um, Otherwise, you'll probably want to stick to transform delay. Let's clean that up. And by the way, you really do want to clean rather than go and start deleting layers. Because as you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's some nulls in here that are there to help out. And there's a main uh, parent null down here. Um, now, if you don't want to see all this, all you have to do is hit the shy button. And most of that stuff will go away, just showing you your first layer. But hit the clean button to get rid of stuff. So let's do that animation again. So let me uh, set my position keyframe, go out to a second and a half, move it out behind the camera. And do the rotation. So a couple keyframes and rotate this negative 180. So now I'm going to go into echo space. Uh, let's just reset one more time, make sure everything's uh, all zeroed out. Set my instances to 15. And my transform delay, I'm going to set to 0.1 and hit repeat. And now we've got the bulk of the animation happening. Uh, I'm going to set my opacity to negative 2 right now, just so we can uh, kind of see through these layers just a little bit. And let's hit the shy switch to clean things up and talk about how we're going to color map these. So I want to be able to color map from an image because echo space doesn't have it built in. So I don't have a, a gradient layer that I can use in here. So I want to use my own gradient image. Now you can create your gradient with a After Effects layer style or Photoshop document. Um, I'm going to use uh, After Effects layer style gradient overlay and then just add a gradient like that. And this is going to be my image. And I want this inside of pre-comp because layer styles uh, are not visible to expressions uh, the way we're going to be using them. So we need to put it in a pre-comp so uh, it is going to be visible to expressions. So. Here's the short story of what I want to do. I'm going to set up a series of two-dimensional points on this image. By points, I mean expression controls that are the point control. So let me show you just one of these. Here's a point control, and it has an x, y uh, location. That's all it really does. So this point is going to be a sampling point that I'm going to use for my first echo space layer. In fact, I'll call this color one. Now, if I made a bunch of duplicates of this, color one, two, three, four, five, let's go up to 10, for each of my echo space layers, I'm going to have the color of that echo space layer. So let's say this is my first echo space layer. That'll sample that first point. This layer will sample the next point. This layer will sample the next point, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to have all of these points evenly distributed along this gradient. And this is easy to do with After Effects 
expressions. So let me show you a little visual representation of what we're going to do here. Let's say I have a comp that is 1,280 pixels wide, and I want to distribute 16 points evenly along this composition, starting at 0. So at the very uh, first pixel on the left side of the screen, which would be 0, all the way to the other side. So what I need to figure out is how many pixels in between I need to spread these out. And that would be the width of the comp in pixels divided by how many points we want to distribute. So if I divide the comp width by the number of points, I find out that these need to be 80 pixels apart. So each of these points you see right here is actually 80 pixels apart. So we need to put these points, um, the, although the y uh, value doesn't matter, the x value needs to be at 0, 80, 160, 240, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that actually becomes a lot simpler for us if we simply remember that these values, 0, 80, 160, etc., are 80 times 0, 80 times 1, 80 times 2. Now I mentioned that we're going to have a bunch of effects, color 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So as these increase in number, effect number 1, effect number 2, effect number 3, we'll use that number in the effects chain to drive its position. So rather than drag you through the process of writing the expression, I'll simply copy and paste it and explain to you the few parts that are there. In fact, I can go in here and just delete 2 through 10 because those are going to go away. We're going to uh, duplicate this first one. So I'm going to create an expression for color 1 here. Just Option or Alt click on the stopwatch. I'm going to paste this expression. So the first thing that I'm going to do is sign a variable. If you've not used expressions before, a variable is just a container. It just says that this is equal to all this stuff that is a lot bigger and more complicated than just saying that. So I'm going to use the word instances to be equal to all this stuff over here. And where I got all that stuff is by pick whipping the effect echo space. So if I put my cursor right there, grab the pick whip and select instances, I'll get all the code that I need to reference the number of instances. So if I change that, this will update. Now, I need to add one because I want the number of layers that I've got, not the number of actual instances. Remember, instances are the clones. So I've got one layer plus 15 instances. So I need to add plus one. And at the end, I need to put a semicolon. Now, the stuff down here is simply, again, we're assigning a variable, x is equal to this calculation over here. The first stuff is pretty straightforward. This is exactly what I showed you in the little diagram. The composition width divided by the number of layers, so instances plus the main layer, equals how far apart they need to be spaced. So right here I have this comp width, which is equal to the uh, comp width in pixels my instances variable, which is equal to the number of layers that I need. So that gives me how far apart they need to be spaced. And notice this is in parentheses. So I'm going to take this value and multiply it by this value. This is actually just one number. And what we're doing is grabbing the number of the effect that we're using. So color one is the first effect of the effects group. The effects group, all of these effects are part of a property group number one. Effects are number one. They're actually the first in the chain. So all this really says is we're looking inside this current property inside property group number one, which is all, which is the effects group. And we are using the number of the current effect. So color one is the first effect. Therefore, this word property index is equal to the value one. And then I subtract one. And notice that's all inside parentheses. So this first value is 0 because we have 1 minus 1. So once I duplicate this, color number 2 at this point is going to be at 80 pixels because this is the second effect. Property index is uh, 2. Oops, let's actually look in the right layer. Property index is 2 for the second effect. So 2 minus 1 is 1, times 80 is 80. So if I keep duplicating this over and over and over, we'll see that we'll get 16, if I do 
duplicate it enough times, 16 evenly distributed sample points along this gradient. Now that I've got all those sample points set, you might be wondering, well, what the heck are we going to do with sample points? These aren't colors, they're just sample points. Fortunately, in After Effects expressions, there is a sampling function. We can say, look at this point on an image and tell us what color that is. And I need something to apply color to. I'm going to, um, well, first, let's just solo this layer right here. And I'll use something like fill. So I'm just going to fill this layer with a color. And I'm going to, again, create an expression. Let's pull that full frame. And again, I'm just going to copy paste, although this isn't a very complicated expression, but this just makes it move a little quicker. So we have to define a point, uh, an x, y point. And that is what this sample point variable is. So this variable is equal to something inside this comp uh, at a layer that's called the layer gradient. That's the one we were working at. Uh, and look for an effect. And normally in here, we name the effect by name, like Gaussian blur or hue saturation or whatever. But effects can also be referenced by number. So look at the effect labeled, uh, let's say if I do it like this, effect number one point. And down here we have effects and we have our color number one and we have a point. So it's going to sample uh, that point uh, at zero and uh, 50 in that image. Now, let me come back to that. So let's just assume we're calling this effect number one. Now, if I call this effect number two, it's actually going to sample color number two. So let's just uh, leave it at effect number one, and then we'll backtrack up there. Sample radius is simply uh, a pixel in uh, a 10 by 10 pixel area that I can sample in. Uh, I don't have to use this, but I decided to average it together just a little bit. So then, this color becomes a sample image. This is a function built into expressions. So it's going to sample the image at that sample point using that sample radius of a layer called a gradient inside this comp. So basically, it's looking in this comp, finding a layer called gradient, running this function called sample image at this sample point using the sample radius. So that sample point is defined right here, and it's pulling point number one. Now, why is it pulling that point? Because we said, use the very first effect. This doesn't do us a whole lot of good if we have to go and manually enter this, uh, change this for each duplicate, you know, effect number one and effect number two, effect number three. But fortunately, After Effects layers also have a unique number called their index. So layer number that you see right here is its index number. So layer two has an index value of two. Layer three has an index of three. So if I want this effect, to be number one for layer number two. Uh, again, this would be uh, less complicated if I didn't have a camera at the very top. Now, index is equal to two, and this will work. It's just going to sample the second color instead of the first. So all I have to do is subtract one. And then we're set. So every duplicate is going to look at the corresponding color sample down here on the gradient. In fact, if I go into Echo Space, um, clean those up, which is uh, actually not as destructive as you might think. I mean, I've, I've got all of my uh, animation on this first layer, and I've really just kind of blown away all those layers. But I've got my fill effect on here now, and if I hit uh, repeat, it's going to keep that effect on all of the clones. And now you can see that each of the copies is being mapped from the gradient on the fly. We could actually animate that gradient, really, if you wanted. And I can hit the shy switch and uh, simplify the whole thing down. So we basically it looks like we've got four layers, which is pretty cool. Although, I got to do one thing here. Let's unshy that. I'm going to hit uh, tilde to bring that full screen. Select all these layers. Hit F4 to show my blending modes. And I'm going to set the blending mode to add and then hit the shy switch again now this is going to be a little bit hot we'll bring down the opacity just a little bit now uh, again these are all clone layers so they're all following the first layer so if, if i animate this opacity from let's say zero to seven five they're all going to have a value of 75 following this first layer now if i look at this 
beginning here, it looks like my Z offset was still at 10. I'm going to zero that out so that we don't have any Z extrusion. There we go. That's how you map colors to Echospace layers. So if you keep this project on hand, you'll basically be able to apply whatever gradient you want to whatever Echospace layers you have. In fact, you probably didn't need to sit through this entire tutorial. You probably just used the, the preset. But sitting through the tutorial gives you a much better understanding of what's going on and how you can customize it for your own needs. So let's do just a little bit of color correction and final touches to get this ready for broadcast. Now, because we are using things that depend on layer order, like that index, I would suggest not throwing additional color correction layers in your composition. I'd say I put a couple color correction layers. You notice that each layer shifts the whole color map down because we have things that are dependent on layer order. So I would suggest to just nest this in another composition. Here's a nice little quick tip for you. Right click down here, go to reveal composition and project and we'll show you exactly where that comp is. And now I can nest that in another comp quite quickly and easily. So this will be my echo space composite. And this is where we'll lay in color correction and backgrounds and all that kind of stuff. I'll add a solid in the background, just a black solid and drop a ramp on there or a gradient. I'll use a radial ramp. Just kind of darken it up a little bit. Maybe put something that's kind of between reddish and purplish. That. Now on this uh, main echo space layer, you know, it looks very crisp and modern and all that. So I wanted to blur this up just a little bit. I found that using just a, a bit of a radial blur does a good job at kind of blurring it and as well as adding a little bit of a motion blur, zoom, that kind of thing. So it just kind of softens it up so it's not so crisp. Now, next I'm going to create a new solid to apply magic bullet looks to get our color correction done. And the reason I want to use looks for this is that uh, there's actually a very uh, useful uh, preset kit that we can use uh, called Vintage Film by Nick Campbell. Let's go to my looks here. And I think this is them right here. Yep. Um, there's a number of presets in here, but this is an additional pack uh, called Vintage Film. And I'm going to use one of the cross process presets here uh, called cross process green or maybe basic. I'm going to use basic, but I'm going to add one more thing in here. Um, you know, there's a nice little vignette and uh, uh, some nice correction with lift gamma gain. I'm going to add one more tool uh, in the lens section, which is chromatic aberration. So I'm just going to get a little bit of a separation between the reds and greens and blues. I need to zoom up just a little bit to get to the controls. So as I push these, you can see the reds and the greens. It's a subtle effect, but it's going to separate those edges a little bit, I think give it a nice uh, vintage kind of feel. All right, it's taken shape. Um, I'm going to add just a little bit of shine on here. I know it's not on the original, but hey, it's my updated version. Uh, so I want just a few uh, kind of light rays coming out of this. There's always creative ways to use, uh, well, anything, but especially trap code shine. There's a lot you can do with it. So I'll set this to screen, set the shine opacity to 50%. And in the colorize section, instead of using any of the presets, I'm just going to set it to none. So it's going to pull the original colors off of the original sampled image. But I'm going to really crank up this shimmer, which kind of uh, breaks the lines of the light rays into streaks and add some more detail to that. Now, if you really want to get that sort of old film kind of look, um, Including with the Magic Bullet Suite is a set of plugins called Magic Bullet Misfire. Now I can just drop one main plugin on here called Misfire and just check these on or off. So there's a little bit of fading, funk, dust, and uh, and yet flicker, that kind of stuff that we can apply to give it an old kind of film look. And do deep scratches to give these sort of 
uh, vertical scratches in there. You can even do a gate weave that makes it sort of uh, shimmy side to side and film fading and that kind of stuff. So if we take a look at my rendered version here, you can see some of that film junk going on in there. That pretty much wraps it up. My name's Harry Frank. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks, Harry. You know, with Netflix, my kids don't even know what a commercial is, let alone the idea that their show could be put off until next week. Thank you for making me feel old. If you enjoyed this tutorial, check out Harry's site at graymachine.com where you can find a whole bunch of awesome goodies, including free presets, tutorials, and a link to Harry's fantastic training DVDs like Complete Training for Trap Code Particular or Trap Code Form Training. Also, don't forget to check out Harry's killer Red Giant Guru preset packs, looping backgrounds for Trap Code Suite, cinematic flares for No Light Factory, video rock for Particular, weddings for Trap Code Suite, and holidays for Particular. Because hey, it's always that most wonderful time of the year. And by the way, you can get all of those and much more as a part of the Red Giant Guru Suite. Don't forget, you can download a free trial version of the software that Harry used in this tutorial at RedGiantSoftware.com, and you can get free presets for Red Giant plugins on RedGiantPeople.com. And to keep up with the latest news about new products, tutorials, tips, and deals, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or on our blog. Once again, I'm Aaron Rabinowitz for RedGiantTV.com. I'll see you next time.